Hey guys, I just wanted to talk to you today um, about the events that are happening in the world. Um, and I want to remind you of our blessed hope because I believe that time is very, very short. I believe that our King is returning any moment at any time. And I want to be found feeding the sheep when he returns, as I know that many of you want to be found feeding the sheep when he returns. There are many who call themselves Christians today who are beating the sheep. They're spreading a false gospel. They're spreading bad news. They're causing fear and dissension amongst the flock. They're causing the sheep to be devoured. But when he returns, what will he find? Will he find faith? I pray that when he returns, that we will be found preaching the good news of the gospel message, that salvation is the free gift of God offered to all and to anyone who believes, simply believes. God has offered salvation as a free gift. God is not a used car salesman. When God says it's a free gift, there's no Ponzi scheme attached. There's no clause. There's no read in between the lines. If God says that salvation is a free gift, and he does over and over again, then he means it. God is not a con artist. He is not a used car salesman. There are many people coming in his name that are, but God is not. So I pray that all of us are being assured of our blessed hope, that we are encouraging one another with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, not by their ability to save themselves, but by his perfect righteousness, by his perfect life, and by his death and resurrection on the cross. And that anyone, anyone and everyone who simply puts their faith in what he did on their behalf shall be saved. Romans 11 says that the gifts and callings of God are beyond repentance. What that means is, God does not change his mind about his gifts, which means salvation, which he himself calls a free gift, cannot be taken away. It is given as a free gift. God keeps his promises. He is a covenant keeper, not a covenant breaker. God does not believe in divorce, okay? He is a covenant keeper. If God made a promise that all who look to the Son and believe on him shall be saved, you can take that to the bank because God cannot lie. God is truthful. His promises are true. And Jesus is coming very, very soon. He is returning for his bride, for his children. And he said it you can believe it and you can take it to the bank and you can assure your brothers and sisters of that as well. I hope and pray that we are all encouraging one another at the proper time, feeding one another, feeding the sheep, the good news, because unfortunately today, most of modern Christianity has lost the good news and they are preaching a bad news gospel, a gospel that says, do these things and you shall live. Do these things not and you shall die. They are going the way of Cain, offering up the fruits of their own labor, the sweat from their brow to God. And they're teaching others to do this. On the contrary, Abel offered up the blood sacrifice. He offered up the firstborn of his flock. And that's what we ought to be doing as Christians. That is the good news gospel message, that Jesus Christ did everything that is required for you to be saved and you can abide in him. That word abide in him, that means to trust and dwell in him and in him alone. He says that I am the way, the truth and the life and no man gets to the father but by me. I am the gate for the sheep. Enter by me and you shall be saved. He says that he is surrounded, though, by thieves and robbers, by people who are trying to climb into the kingdom by some other way than by him. 
and he says on the day of judgment that those people who are doing this will be treated just like thieves and robbers. They will be promptly booted out of the kingdom, for they are not welcome. They did not enter by the gate. They did not enter by Christ, who is the gate. They tried to get in by some other way, and on the day of judgment, they will be promptly booted out, and there will be gnashing of teeth into outer darkness. Folks, there is only one way. Christ himself is that way. It's not you. It's not your performance. Folks, that is the old covenant system that unfortunately most of Christianity is begging to revive today. The old covenant system that says, do these things and you shall live, do these things not and you shall die, right out of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. That system is a ministration of death and condemnation. It always has been. Nobody has ever been saved by that system. It is a yoke of bondage that neither we nor our forefathers have ever been able to bear. And yet there are so many Christians who are begging to revive it and live under it. Paul could never understand it and neither can I. He says, you, those of you who want to live under the law, do you not know, you who are trying to be justified before God by the works of the law, that you are placing yourself under his curse, for you are obligated to do all that the law commands. You see, you cannot take bits and pieces of the law. It comes as a whole package. Even adding something as small as circumcision places you under all of it. And yes, that includes the Ten Commandments, the thou shall nots. To be under any portion of it is to be under all of it. And to break any portion of it is to break all of it, which is why it itself is a curse. This is why Paul in 2 Corinthians calls it a ministration of death and condemnation. It cannot save. It has never saved a single soul. It has condemned many, though. And unfortunately, to this day, Christianity, by and large, is begging to be back under that old covenant system. And this is what Jesus means when he says that the path to life is narrow and few find it. Folks, Christianity as a whole and all of its many denominations, the vast majority of Christianity is preaching the same tired old religious message that every other false religion on this earth preaches. That there is something that you must do to make yourself right with God by your work, by your merit, by your effort. That is the same lie taught in every false religion on the face of this earth. Whether you call your God Allah, whether you call your God Buddha, Shiva, the all, whatever, they're all based in the same lie from the enemy that it's something you must do to be like God, to make yourself right with God. You can be like God and no good from evil. Every false religious system on this planet is based in that lie. And most of Christianity today has adopted it. There's only one message that is different, and that is the true way, the true life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but by me. I am the gate for the sheep. Enter by me, and you shall be saved. But oh, how beautiful that fruit looks on the outside, that forbidden fruit. The tree of the law, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and its fruit looks so beautiful and succulent and delicious on the outside to our flesh because it glorifies our flesh. It allows us to glory in ourselves and our own righteousness. You can be like God. You can know good from evil. You can live up to the standard. You can make yourself right. You can make yourself righteous. It glories to the flesh. It appeals and tempts this flesh. That forbidden fruit looks so beautiful and delicious on the outside, but on the inside, it is death. Just like those who teach it. 
just like those who hand out that fruit of death. Jesus describes them as white washed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but inside they are dead men's bones. You will know a tree by its fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. The bad tree that always produces bad fruit will always produce death. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the law, it looks so appealing on the outside, as do its ministers. But on the inside, it is death. Jesus, on the other hand, the tree of life, his fruit, if you eat of it, you will never hunger, you will never thirst, you will never die. And a good tree can never produce bad fruit, not even one. You can trust in the risen Christ. The cross and Christ crucified is everything. You are complete in him. He has done everything that is required to save your soul. That is the good news. That is the narrow path that you're not hearing from anywhere else. The path is truly narrow and few find it. There are two ministers and two trees. One is handing out the tree of knowledge of good and evil and its fruit of death. They are telling you that in order to be made right with God, you need to merit God's righteousness. You need to earn God's righteousness. You need to be like God. You need to keep the law. You are the one who saves yourself. That salvation is based on you and your merit. It's the same old rotten, tired message that you're going to hear in every false religion in the world. And then there's the minister of the tree of life who's handing you the fruit of life. Eat of that fruit and you shall never die. You shall never perish. You shall never thirst. You shall never hunger. And that fruit is Jesus. Abide in me, he says, and you will never hunger. You will never thirst. You will never die. To abide in Jesus is to trust in Jesus and him alone. It's to not be like the thief and the robber in John chapter 10, trying to climb into the kingdom by some other way. He says, I am the gate for the sheep. Enter by me and you shall be saved. And how hard it is for us to set down our pride to do that. How hard it is to turn away from that forbidden fruit and humble ourselves and say, I cannot do it. I require the righteousness of another. I surrender. I wave the white flag. Jesus, save me. You are the Savior, Jesus, not me. You are the one with whom God is well pleased. You are the one that I am putting my trust in. I repent. I change my mind from the way of the world and the world system, the world religious system that says, I must earn my way. I must merit my way. I must go my own way. And instead, I put my trust in your son. Yes, I believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. He is God made flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And yes, I believe that he did everything that's required of me to be saved because he is Mashiach, Messiah. And I put my faith in him. And yes, I believe the Lord rose him from the dead. And that is a promise that I too shall be risen with him because I have placed my trust in him. Finally, I wanna leave you with three examples of what it looks like to abide in Christ, to trust in Christ. The first one is the thief on the cross, a man who had nothing to offer God but a lifetime of his own sin. He was hanging on that cross, rightly so, for his many, many sins. And yet, with one mustard seed of faith, when he asked the King of Kings, remember me when you get to your kingdom, in that moment, he passed from death to life. 
and the Lord promised him everlasting life. He did not get down off that cross to get baptized. He did not get off that cross to turn from all of his sins. He had a mustard seed of faith and the Lord pronounced over him in that moment. I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus tells a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up before God and boasted of all his works. The tax collector, all he did was bow his head and say, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. He didn't offer up God one single work, not one solitary ounce of self-righteousness. He pleaded to God's mercy and to his grace. That man walked away justified and not the former, not the religious man who the world would have looked at and said, that man is holy, that man is righteous, that man's going to heaven, that man is going to hell. That man trusted in himself. That man dared, dared to stand before the most high God and proclaim that he earned salvation. What a fool. Only a fool does that. That is a foolish, foolish thing to do. And I tell you, on the day of judgment, there will be many just like that man. And that is absolutely tragic. Tragic. Because God has made salvation so easy. He's made it so simple. It's a free gift. But you can't pay for it. You can't be like Simon and try to buy the Holy Spirit. It must come as a gift. And in order for you to do that, you've got to set down every sense of self-righteousness, every effort on your behalf to buy it or earn it and receive it as a gift. I pray on this day, as, to- as short as time is in this world, that when Jesus returns, that what he finds is faith. And the law is not of faith. The law says, do these things and you shall live. Do these things not and you shall die. Faith is trusting in Christ and what he did. Christ and Christ crucified for me, for you, and for anyone else who wants to receive it as a free gift. Preach the good news because time is very, very short. I love you guys.